Hi, my name is Ronald Edelman. I'm a New York art lawyer. I've been representing people in the art world in the areas of real estate, intellectual property, corporate law, and commercial law for 30 years. I'm going to focus on the commercial real estate challenges and responses for galleries and other art-related businesses in the wake of the coronavirus crisis. I will also cover some related issues like bankruptcy and governmental programs to help small businesses get through the crisis. The coronavirus crisis could easily be the worst disaster for the U.S. in recent memory. As you know, all non-essential brick and mortar businesses have been shut. Art galleries and other art-related businesses have all been deemed non-essential. This is a time where every art professional must carefully review how to remain sustainable. If you're an arts professional with a commercial lease, then this presentation will discuss everything you need to know to get through this. I will also cover the governor's order preventing commercial evictions and on the potential rent freeze options galleries may have. I'll start with a couple of quick points comparing commercial leases with residential leases. In New York, courts view commercial tenants less favorably than residential tenants. For example, residential tenants can more easily terminate leases if the landlord fails to provide an essential service like running water. It's also been harder to evict residential tenants for non-payment than commercial tenants. However, the crisis has changed that, at least temporarily. I'll discuss that shortly. But for now, I've heard that some commercial landlords are willing to be more flexible with negotiating and enforcing leases as a result of the crisis. This makes sense because forcing a good tenant out in the current situation may result in months or years of vacancy. There's a five month moratorium on eviction proceedings against commercial tenants in New York. The moratorium began on March 20th and will end on August 20th, but further extensions are possible. Landlords can't file new eviction cases during this period and can't take any further steps in cases that were previously filed. Even threats to sue are unlawful harassment and can bring heavy fines. The courts are just barely beginning to reopen. This means that even when the moratorium ends, there will be long delays due to the backlog. But a moratorium does not mean that you don't owe or need to pay rent. It only means that you can't be evicted for now. Some state senators have proposed a bill that would free commercial tenants, including galleries, from the obligation to pay rent for three months if they can demonstrate that they were affected by the crisis. Galleries were included in the non-essential businesses that had to close, so they would be eligible. Of course, this would be a great help to most galleries, but it would have to be approved by Governor Cuomo in addition to the state legislature. This is ongoing and you need to watch for future developments. So let's assume that you have a commercial lease and have cash flow issues related to the crisis. What do you need to know? What can you do? I'm now going to discuss some strategies for dealing with your lease. Let's look first at the force majeure clause, which is in most leases. It can go by other names, including act of God, inability to perform, or similar language dealing with natural or man-made disasters. Here's one sample, which covers strikes or other labor disputes, fire or other casualty, accidents, any orders of any governmental authority or any other cause beyond owner's reasonable control. I highlighted the government authority language because that's the one that applies to this crisis. The next step is to see what it excuses the tenant from doing or not doing. In the best case, it will be a reason a tenant can terminate a lease. Or if the tenant doesn't want to terminate, it may excuse the tenant from paying rent while the emergency is ongoing. Let's look next at the landlord's representations and warranties. In some leases, the landlord warrants that the lease space will be usable for the intended purpose. In other words, the landlord makes a binding promise that a space leased as a gallery can actually be used as a gallery. Government orders during the crisis mean that, means that galleries can't be operated as galleries. A warranty like the one I described would allow the gallery tenant to get out of the lease. But most leases say that landlords aren't responsible for things that are out of control, which probably covers the current situation. But you should look at the, the lease anyway to see if yours is more favorable to you in terms of the reps and warranties. There's no question that the courts in New York enforce landlord warranties in favor of tenants. Let's look next to see whether there is or isn't a personal guarantee. 
In almost all commercial leases, the tenant is a corporation or limited liability company. This includes gallery tenants. If the tenant is a business entity, the individuals who run the entity are not personally liable for the lease. To counter that, many landlords require one or more individuals to make a personal guarantee. You should review the lease to see if there is a personal guarantee. The guarantee may be in a separate document, so don't just rely on the lease itself. Carefully reviewing the existence of the guarantee is a crucial step in determining the degree of personal risk on the lease. If there's no personal guarantee, the tenant may be able to escape the lease because the landlord cannot sue individuals for unpaid rent. Until recently, personal guarantees were generally valid and enforceable. But on May 26, New York City passed a new law that bars the enforcement of a personal guarantee if it was made by an individual and either the business is a retail establishment that was deemed non-essential or that was ordered to limit employees and or customers between March and September 2020. Virtually every gallery in the city falls within these definitions. Any attempts by landlords to enforce personal guarantees subject to this law are invalid, and they'll also be considered unlawful harass harassment and could in theory be subject to criminal fines. The law doesn't apply to guarantors that are other corporate entities instead of individuals. So it's important to check the identity of the guarantor, not simply rely on the wording in the agreement as a quote, personal guarantee. It's a major step to have a law that declares a whole class of contracts unenforceable. The law will be challenged by landlords, but until a court rules in favor of the landlords, the law is valid. Next, look to see if the lease has what's called a good guy or early termination clause. A good guy clause permits a tenant to terminate a lease early if the tenant has fully complied with its obligations under the lease and wants to leave. This means that rent payments must be up to date and the premises must be in good physical condition, usually referred to as broom clean condition. The good guy clause can be a lifesaver if you have one. If your lease doesn't have the good language I described, it's always possible to add it by mutual consent in writing. If it's possible, renegotiating the terms of the lease is preferable to treating the landlord as an adversary. Of course, this requires that your landlord is willing to renegotiate and that you have a good relationship. The main terms to renegotiate are generally the length of the lease, the amount of the lease, and the right to sublease. Remember, any clause in a lease can be modified by mutual consent in writing. Never rely on anything agreed to verbally. Verbal changes to leases are unenforceable. Let's focus briefly on subletting. Standard commercial lease forms in New York generally prohibit subletting, so it must be covered explicitly in an amendment or rider. Generally, the most important aspects of subletting from the tenant's perspective are the right to return after the sublet ends and the right to keep the difference between the amount of rent the tenant pays to the landlord and the hopefully higher amount the subtenant pays you under the sublease. If you have the right to sublet or can negotiate this right and keep the excess rent, this can go a long way to keeping you afloat until things settle. Redemption means that if the landlord sues to evict for non-payment of rent, the tenant can redeem, meaning keep the property, by paying all rent due up to the date of redemption. The tenancy will then continue until the end of the lease. Redemption is a possible option for a tenant who has more than five years before his lease expires. But the right of redemption is waived if the tenant fails to use it within one year after the landlord starts the eviction proceeding. Redemption can be and usually is waived in a lease. If that's the case, then paying back rent won't allow you to redeem. But if it isn't waived, it can be an important step toward keeping your space if you want to do that long term. Until now, I've looked at solutions that avoid litigation, but sometimes getting court involved is the only viable option. Let's look first at the Yellowstone injunction. If the landlord is threatening to bring an eviction case, the tenant can beat him to the punch by bringing a motion asking the court to issue a Yellowstone injunction. If the court issues the injunction, the landlord is barred from evicting the tenant unless and until the eviction case is finally decided against the tenant. This has proved to be a powerful weapon for tenants fighting eviction. However, the highest court in New York limited its effectiveness in a 2019 decision 
holding that the right can be waived in advance in the lease. As with redemption, a careful review of the lease is vital before beginning a court proceeding. If none of the options I've already mentioned are available or desirable, and you don't pay rent, there's a good chance that the landlord will sue after the moratorium to evict you and get damages for unpaid rent. Almost all commercial leases in New York provide for acceleration of rent. That means that if the tenant fails to pay rent for a particular month, the landlord can declare the tenant to be in default and then immediately seek all rent due through the last day of the lease. That means that if your rent is at $10,000 monthly and you have three years left on your lease, the landlord will sue you for $360,000. New York courts generally enforce acceleration clauses, but a recent trend is for the courts to deny the full accelerated sum if it would give the landlord an unfair financial windfall. As with many parts of the law, there's no clear definition of what is a windfall. It'll be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. I expect that the courts will have a sympathetic view of the hardships of gallery and other small business tenants in the wake of the coronavirus, but it's impossible to predict at this point. Now let's turn to bankruptcy as an option. If your current or prospective debts outweigh your assets by so much that the business can't be operated without restructuring, bankruptcy may be a viable choice. Your attorney will advise you to file under Chapter 11 if you hope to continue the business after getting out of bankruptcy, or under Chapter 7 if you intend to close the business and liquidate. Bankruptcy can be a major stigma for, for small businesses regarding credit and other things. However, bankruptcy can also have significant benefits. Most important, it automatically stops all pending and threatened proceedings in other courts. Instead, the bankruptcy judge will decide all disputes. He or she is much more likely to have more experience and understanding of the issues facing an insolvent business than judges in other courts. Chapter 11 is designed for businesses that are in financial difficulty, but expect to be able to continue. Many times the court will agree that the same people who operated the business previously can continue as debtor in possession. The debtor in possession has a fair amount of leeway to operate the business as it did before, but all actions can be subject to court review. The court may decide that the operators of the business are not sufficiently responsive to the interests of creditors and appoint a Chapter 11 trustee to run the business. Alternatively, the court can decide that reorganization is hopeless and convert the case to Chapter 7, which is designed to liquidate the business. However, if everything works as planned, the business's debts to creditors will be fully discharged and the business will leave bankruptcy with a fresh start. Chapter 7 is designed for businesses that have no hope of continuing. The court appoints a trustee who removes the former operators. The only real purpose of a Chapter 7 case is to maximize assets to satisfy the claims of creditors. Assuming that the tenant decides to go with Chapter 11, soon after it files, it has to decide whether to accept or reject its current contracts, including the lease. Accepting the lease means that the tenant must continue to pay rent and comply with all of the lease obligations. The lease can only be amended with the landlord's consent or by order of the bankruptcy court. Rejecting the lease terminates it and terminates the tenant's obligations, including rent. But it's likely that as a result, it will be extremely hard to get a new lease from a new landlord in the foreseeable future. A bankruptcy filing also has significant effect on the artwork the gallery is holding on consignment. The key distinction is between primary consignment artwork and secondary consignment artwork. Primary consignment artwork refers to artwork the artist consigns to the gallery. Under New York law, the artwork consigned by the artist who created it is subject to special protection. Creditors have no claims to those works. Without exception, the artist gets them back. Secondary consignment artwork usually refers to artwork consigned to the gallery by a collector. There are fewer legal protections for consigner collectors. Instead, the artwork can become part of the bankruptcy estate of the gallery and eventually sold, with proceeds going to creditors generally rather than the particular collectors. But a gallery can, and probably should, as a sound business practice, advise consigners to protect themselves at the time of consignment. The way to do this is by perfecting a security interest in the artwork. This can be done through, the, through executing a simple form and filing it with the relevant government office. In New York, that's the Secretary of State. For more information on protecting your consigners, it's best to consult with an attorney.
Litigation should be viewed as a last resort. It's expensive, with costs running five figures and up. The expense is potentially compounded if the lease has a clause providing that the loser pays the winner's attorney's fees. It's also very slow. A span of two years from start to finish is common. Either side can start lease litigation. More commonly, the landlord starts it, but tenants regularly start the process through the Yellowstone motion we discussed. The initial documents are usually the complaint and answer, although the answering party can also make whatever counterclaims it may have if counterclaims have not been waived in the lease. The parties then engage in discovery. This is where all parties have to turn over all documents that are relevant to the case. The term documents includes electronic information such as emails and texts. The parties then move to depositions. Depositions are questions asked by the lawyers responded to by the opposing party. The witness is under oath and the questions and answers are transcribed by a court reporter. After discovery, one or both sides will usually file motions for summary judgment. In essence, they're asking the court to decide the case in their favor before it goes to trial. If the court doesn't grant the motion in favor of one side or another, the case will then go to trial. It's important to note that the, there are delays between each of these steps. These delays are usually measured in months. If the matter goes to trial and judgment, legal costs can easily exceed $50,000. After winning on summary judgment or a trial, a successful landlord will receive a judgment. The judgment is the dollar amount consisting of unpaid rent and any other applicable charges plus interest. Collecting a judgment is often harder than getting one. As lawyers say, you can't get blood from a stone. For individual tenants, certain property is exempt from judgments. And with rare exceptions, the judgment creditor cannot seek to collect from spouses or family. For judgment debtors that are business entities like LLCs or corporations, the landlord almost always cannot try to collect from individuals who manage or own the business. This is where the significance of a personal guarantee comes into play. And this is why the new New York City law adds an extra level of complication and protection for tenants as we have discussed. However, landlords have an extremely long time to collect on a judgment. In New York, it's 20 years. Finally, I'd like to talk briefly about government programs that may be available to galleries and other small businesses in New York. These programs change, so please understand that some of what I mention here may be out of date by the time you see this. I urge all of you to get all of the governmental assistance that's available to you. Unfortunately, state and local programs are currently on hiatus due to lack of funding. Those programs were, one, a grant of up to 40% of two months of payroll for businesses with five or less employees, and two, an interest-free loan of up to $75,000 for businesses with less than 100 employees. It's not clear if they'll be restored. The situation changes continually, and so I can only suggest that you consult the brochure released by the New York City Department of Small Business Services found in the notes to this presentation. It's updated at least monthly. It lists the available U.S. Small Business Association programs, which I'll describe shortly. The NYC SBS offers a sign-up to see new developments as they come online. It can be found at the link found in the notes to the presentation. The only significant federal program available right now is the Paycheck Protection Program. It applies to businesses with 500 or fewer employees and gives loans of up to $10 million or two and a half times annual payroll. If the money is used for payroll, rent, mortgage interest, or utilities, and employees remain on the payroll for the full eight-week period, the loan will be forgiven. Otherwise, it's repayable at a 1% interest rate over two years. The other principal program from the SBA was an economic injury disaster loan, an advance of up to $150,000. The SBA is not taking new applications for those loans, but the program may be restored if Congress provides additional funding. Dealing with the SBA takes a lot of effort, and there were rumors that the Paycheck Protection Program has run out of money. However, as of now, this appears to be untrue. The best advice is to be persistent. Expert assistance may also be helpful. Without question, the Paycheck Protection Program is worth pursuing. So, to sum up, remember the rent moratorium. Check for a possible rent waiver or freeze if approved by state government. Review your lease for the force majeure clause, 
the landlord's representations and warranties, the personal guarantee or the lack, and the good guy clause. Keep following new legal developments, including the new bar on enforcement of personal guarantees. Take advantage of local, state, and federal small business assistance. Speak to an attorney about using every strategy available to you to deal sustainably with the crisis. Inaction is more likely to harm you than finding a way forward. As difficult as it is to imagine, crises can create opportunities if they can be seen and pursued. A large part of my job is to help art professionals find opportunities and protect their businesses under all circumstances. I wish you all the best of luck and insight in these unprecedented times, and I look forward to being of service. Please feel free to reach out with any questions you may have.